Hey, good night, it's Prezo here back in the shop and I'm working today on one of those really super nerdy projects that I like and this one's no exception and you're looking at this stuff and you're probably asking yourself a lot of questions already and the questions you should be asking are what, why, where, when and how. So let's start with the what. What is it? It's an RGB backlit logo or maker's plate. Next question, why? Why would you want to make one? Well, look, it's to add a bit of flair or a bit of bling or a bit of X-factor to a, a finished project that you might be working on. And where? Uh, where would you use this? The best place to use this would be on a project that already uses either an Arduino or some other sort of microcontroller. Uh, the reason being is that uh, we're going to incorporate some LEDs into the project. In my case, this is going into a clock project that already has a uh, ESP8266 Wi-Fi microcontroller and it interfaces with that. When? When's the best time to do this? Well, now! No, wait, not now. Uh, see the rest of the video first. And how? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's go through each of these components one at a time. We'll see how it all fits together. First off, we're using these little guys. Now these are WS2812B individually addressable RGB LEDs and try saying that when you're drunk. Now these come in a, sort of a matrix when you buy them you can snap them off as individual LEDs you can leave them in rows or a complete matrix if you want to do it that way. Now my project uses three of these but you could run strings of three, five, ten, twelve you know as many as you need to cover the area that you want to work with. Now, they fit into a frame. Now, this is laser cut black acrylic. The LED's been bonded on the back using uh, CA glue and they're run together with copper wire. The soldering is very simple. Each LED has six pads on it. The two outer pads on each side are for positive and negative five volts and the center set of pads are for the data. Now, I don't know if you can see that, but the copper wire connecting the data pads is not continuous. It, it joins from one data out pin to the next adjacent LED's data in pin and then so on down the string. So, but yeah, you know, pretty, pretty straightforward to solder those together. Now, straight away you probably turned off and you're saying, well, I don't have a laser cutter, so I can't do this. No, but you can 3D print that part and it would work perfectly. So don't, buy, don't be put off by the fact that I'm using a laser cutter. This can be done using hand tools even. You could, you know, with a bit of patience, you could cut that out with a coping saw. You could hand file it. You could hand cut the square holes in the center. You know, it's not a big deal. And in fact, all of this stuff is hidden. So, you, you know, don't worry if it doesn't look fantastic. Now, the next two parts are identical in shape. This is a spacer plate. And the purpose of that spacer plate is to give some distance between the front of the LED and the next component in line which is a diffuser screen. Now once again it's exactly the same shape and it's all going to be bonded together to make it sort of a module. Now the, the diffuser screen also laser cut once again you could hand cut this and it's you know it's not difficult to cut acrylic. 3D printing, I know you can get semi-transparent 3D print filaments, so maybe that's an option for you. And once again, you don't see a lot of this when it's assembled, so it may not be an issue if it's got sort of artifacts on the surface of that. Now in my case, this is a semi-translucent white acrylic. Uh, it's good because it allows light to pass through quite easily, but it also diffuses that light. Okay, on top of that, we're going to place a mask. Now if I put that over the top of that white acrylic there, you can see the detail in that mask. And this once again is laser cut and you know, you don't have to do that. You could easily make this with a craft knife and some thin plastic or cardboard. Uh, you know, it's, it's up to your imagination about how you go about doing this. In my case, the level of detail that is required there means that probably laser cutting is the only option. Now you might have a CNC router which is capable of doing some high resolution work and with uh, some tiny little carbide cutters you could probably get a fairly good rendition of that out of some sort of plastic material. Now 
As it turns out, I'm not going to use that mask. We're going to use a different one and we'll look at that later. But the next step is to get these three parts bonded together. Now you could use CA glue. I'm using a product called ethylene dichloride. So that's the ethylene dichloride there. It's a clear solvent specifically designed for binding together acrylic. You can also use MEKP or methyl ethyl ketone peroxide but it's a little bit more hazardous than this material here. You can also buy this as a gel or in a tube. Uh, it's a lot easier to put on but this stuff gives you a, probably a stronger bond. So this is the deal. We're going to uh, pick up our piece of spacer and place it directly on top of the, the back plate where the LEDs are. I've got this uh, gripped, gripped in a record vise here and it's just slightly below the jaws of the vise so that that will help to align that part. The alignment is going to be important at a later stage when we fit this to the project. So what we're going to do next is put a small amount of ethylene dichloride into the bottom of that Pyrex dish. Now you want just enough to wet one side and then we're going to leave it for about uh, a minute and this stuff evaporates off very quickly so you may need to replenish that as we go along but you sort of see it, it sort of still looks wet and liquid in fact that's already starting to dry up so I'm going to put a bit more there and what the solvent will do is it starts to soften the face of the acrylic and turns it into a gel and when you place the two parts together that softening process happens on the bottom part as well and then with a you know good close contact it will actually bond together at an atomic level so it's not like a glue there's no glue interface between the two parts you're actually bonding the molecules of acrylic from one part to the molecules in the other part so you do get a very very strong bond now this should be starting to soften I'm just going to run that around in the liquid solvent that's already there and then put this together. Now you get a minute or two to get everything aligned and then it will be pretty much bonded permanently. So that's already started to set. I'm just sort of doing last minute adjustment there. And that's, that's it. It's pretty straightforward. Now we're going to do exactly the same thing with the screen. Okay, here we go again. I put the assembly lower down in the vise this time, so the spacer is below the top jaws of the vise there. Once again, that's just going to help me with positioning. And before we put our nice clean white acrylic in there, I'm just going to clean out the bottom of this Pyrex dish so there's no black residue. So I just put some clean solvent in there. I'll just wipe that out with the tissue. And you can see a little bit of the black solvent still there. So this time I'm going to put solvent in first. So I don't want to get any of this uh, solvent on the front of the screen. So the amount that you use is very, very small. Even though it starts to evaporate off around the edges of the screen, it will stay liquid underneath. So here's a tip. <laughs> Don't use a deep container like I'm doing. Get yourself something nice and shallow. Make a big mess here. Alright, I made that look terrible, didn't I? But don't worry. Now, if I had any brains there, I would have actually made a little handle on that with a, you know, a bit of stick, uh, say, hot glued onto that screen so you could pick it out of the tray easily. But trust me when I say <laughs> this is the first one of these I've ever made. And it's the old story, you sort of work out the easy way of doing it, you know, 90% of the way into the job. Okay, so that's all bonded together. We'll let that set. So with the screens themselves, I did a number of experiments. So we're talking about the diffuser screen here. So this one is clear acrylic that I scuffed up with some steel wool on both sides. And I wanted to see if this would uh, allow light to pass through more easily. 
It actually does, but you can see the individual LEDs behind that uh, scuffed up screen. So in the end, I decided to go with this uh, diffused acrylic or the, the translucent acrylic. And you can buy this translucent acrylic in colors. It doesn't just come in white. So if you want it to be yellow or red or green, you can get that. But then you sort of, uh, you're compromising the way that these RGB LEDs work. They can produce the color. All you want is for this screen to diffuse that color. So if it was me, I would say use the white translucent acrylic. Now, uh, over that, we're going to place that mask. Now, remember I said that I was going to use uh, a laser cut mask to go on top. And this one works. I've tried it out. It's fine. And this is that two-ply laser engraving plastic. So it's two layers. Uh, this back layer is gold. The top layer is that sort of a marbly reddish brown color. And you can use either side. doesn't matter and it's very thin and it cuts beautifully in the laser. But at the end of the day, because of the project this is going on, I didn't like that. It just looked a bit too busy. Now I did try using acrylic once again. This is the same white translucent acrylic. On this one though, I spray painted the back of it black and then I laser etched through the black paint. And the idea would be on the front, all you would see is the white acrylic and then when it's backlit, the lettering will show through. Now that worked, but once again, wasn't really happy with that. This one was another iteration. It was just the same material, but this one is just laser etched. This one was a complete failure. Uh, it just looked completely uh, full color. On the front there, you couldn't make out the lettering at all. Okay, this one here, this is cut from two pieces of veneer that have been bonded together. So on the front, the grain runs horizontally and on the back, the grain runs vertically. And the idea there was to stabilize the, the veneer and help to make like a very super thin plywood. When you look at the detail on that letter E, there's a very thin bridge. In fact, three very thin bridges, which you know obviously are prone to breakage. So having the dual layer of, of plywood, basically, or the dual layer of veneer, helps to give that some strength. Now when this is finally assembled, that's not going to be an issue and we'll see that shortly. So what I've decided to do is to use a piece of veneer that's already been bonded together. You can see that there. And I've already pre-finished this with a clear acrylic spray. And that's because once this is all assembled, I don't want to have to paint it later uh, because of that issue I mentioned about those very thin bridges. Now I made this material here and I did a second one. This is some um, mahogany burl. I think it's mahogany anyway. Same deal though, it's two pieces of veneer. The front has been finished already and the texture on this is not quite as good. But when it's cut, it might be okay. We'll, we'll try them both, see how they get on. Well, <laughs> I don't know if you can tell, but I've been doing my research and development on this technique. And these are lots of examples of what I've been trying. And my main issue is getting this, this very thin mask to be able to adhere to the acrylic front panel. And this is probably one of my early attempts and I figured that I could glue this down with epoxy or with a PVA of some sort. And that worked fine on MDF, but it was never gonna work on acrylic. And even though, while well, you'd say epoxy will work, but it's going to ooze out into the little pockets uh, through the, the front of that mask there. So I sort of did away with that idea. And then I figured that I could use double-sided tape. And I've got lots of this double-sided tape. It's, uh, it's a El Cheapo brand I got from Aldi, but it's surprisingly good. And I started to get to the idea that I could probably cut the, the logo out, put the tape on the back, and then very carefully cut through it with the scalpel. And I thought, you idiot, I've got a laser cutter. I should be able to just simply cut this from the reverse side and actually cut right through the double-sided tape. And in fact, that's what I did for this one. This is uh, made of oak veneer, and uh, I've just put the tape on, cut through it, stuck it down, works fine. So that's what we're gonna try, but we're gonna have a go at using this uh, already finished veneer. So we'll put the tape on the back of that and we'll give it a try. So I've got enough material here to have a couple of goes at it, so if I mess it up, I can get a second shot at it. 
and what I'm trying to anticipate is what it will look like from the front. Remember, this is the back of the veneer. This is what's going to be stuck to the acrylic screen. So when I turn that over, I've got a fairly prominent piece of grain there and I'll probably try and get it out of this clear area here to start with and then we'll have to go to a couple of others. So we'll leave the backing on the double-sided tape and we're just going to cut straight through that. Okay, I'm just going to have to talk over the noise of this machine. Uh, what I've done here is I've already worked out where the top left-hand corner of that cut process will be and i put my stock on and I've run the perimeter of the cut and I can be sure that it's going to fit onto that tape. This veneer is very light and there's an air assist pump that's blowing air on that red spot there and there's always a danger that it can dislodge the veneer if you don't weight it down or tape it down. I've just got a, a big high speed steel tool bit there because it's nice and heavy and I know it's uh, clear of the cut part so it's not going to bang into anything there. Okay, so let's give it a try. So we're cutting at uh, 10 millimeters a second and the power is 50%. This is uh, roughly a 40 watt tube. And it cuts through this really, really cleanly. front and that is super super clean all the detail is there so I'm really happy about that and we've already got our prepared double sided tape on the back let's try one in this uh, burl veneer and see how that goes Okay, I've powered up the module and it's attached to this other project now. You haven't seen this yet. This is actually a seven segment display clock. I've already put one up on my channel uh, that I call a Vixie clock and this one's similar. It's got a different packaging and uh, I thought afterwards that I could put this backlit logo in the front of the clock. Now these three LEDs are the end of the string which light up the seven segment displays in the front of the clock and whatever colour the front display is this uh, module will show the same colours. However, it's uh, possible to run individual effects on these three LEDs. Just see if I can cycle through the colours for you. So that's sort of a yellow, that's uh, what's that, like dark purple, dark blue, that's white and there's I think about ten colours. I'm not sure how well they're showing up on the screen at the moment. Now, the thing is, when we place the mask over that, you actually see the cutout letters with whatever colour we've got main display set to. And that's the effect that I was hoping to get. So let's turn the clock around and see how this fits in from the front. Well, I don't want to give away too much on the design of this clock because you're going to see it as a separate build video. But just for the moment, you can see I've got a cutout in the front of the case and that's exactly the same size as the actual screen and the LED module itself. And at the moment that's sort of a, a loose-ish sort of fit. And uh, there's nothing holding that in there, but when we put the, the veneer mask on that with its double-sided tape, that will bond it to both the case and the screen as well. And I have to decide now whether we're going to use this lighter colored veneer or the darker colored burl. I've got a feeling that this is too dark, uh, there's no contrast there at all, even though it's backlit, I think this lighter colour veneer is going to work better. So what we'll do now is we'll get the double sided tape 
and bond this veneer mask to the screen and then to the case as well. It's a good thing it's sticky, but it sort of makes handling it a problem. Let go. Come on. I can see it's going to end badly. Got it. Okay. Now, I've got no reference marks here, and I've got to get this thing lined up as accurately as I can. So, be patient. <laughs> this could take a while. Now the end-to-end -end alignment's not all that critical, but it does need to be parallel along the bottom and top edge. Okay, so I think I've got that right. So that's good. And what we're going to do now is push that through the opening in the front of the case and bond it in there permanently. No, I've got everything propped up here on bits of wood and bits of tape and so on, just trying to make sure that I can press this down without sort of damaging the case. So this is just going to slide in now. And the double-sided tape around the edge is going to bond it to the front of the case. Okay, I'm just going to gently roll this with a rubber roller just to make sure we get good contact around the edges. You don't want to overdo it. Okay, that's good. Right, right let's light her up, see what it looks like. Okay, I'm having a bit of trouble getting my camera to see the colors that I can see here. Um, they, to me, they look quite vivid. I think the camera is going to sort of wash them out a bit, but that's the dark blue. Uh, let's see, that's white, that's a purple, that's a yellow, and that's the, the red. But the effect is, uh, it's, it's really striking, and uh, when you see the rest of the project with this built into it, it's going to look fantastic. So, the thing is, uh, you know, can you make something like this? Yes, absolutely. But think about the scale. You know, I've got access to a laser cutter which gives me the, the ability to do very fine resolution. If you had a CNC router, if it was sort of doubled in size, it would work perfectly. If you don't have a CNC router or a laser cutter, you could pretty much cut it out with a sharp scalpel and using something like a, a thin plastic or a card or a, a wood veneer if you want to go that way. But, you know, there's plenty of scope there for experimenting. The other parts can be 3D printed, uh, cut by hand and filed and so on. There's nothing magical about those. But as a concept, and if you've got a project that already has a microcontroller built into it, you can run these RGB LEDs and get some really, really cool effects. And when I started uh, on the second clock, I sort of dawned on me, it dawned on me at that point that I could have done this with my own clock, but I didn't think about it at the time. And this one is going to my friend Mitch Markin in British Columbia in Canada. So it's essentially getting shipped halfway around the world. But I don't mind. Uh, you know, Mitch has given me a lot of help with the code for these clocks and it's something that I don't do very well. So I do appreciate it. So I hope you've learned something from seeing this. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a neat little trick. And the next video I do is going to be the full build of this clock. But I'm also going to do a follow-up where I make a, a resin-filled version of this. So it won't be backlit, but it's going to have some you know, nice resin-filled effects on it. So tune in for that one as well. But uh, I'm going to sign off here now. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you on the next video.